Hey everyone, welcome to today's webcast, New Dog, New Tricks, Introducing the Industry's First Secure Internet Gateway in the Cloud. We're very pleased to have our own Brian Robbie and Bobby Guhasarkar with us today. Brian Roddy runs the cloud security business at Cisco. Brian has more than 20 years of experience in helping build great engineering and operations teams. Brian was the EVP of engineering at OpenDNS and came to Cisco via its acquisition. Brian previously led the engineering team at Jive Software, a leading SaaS collaboration company. Brian was also a founder of Reactivity, a web services security company that was acquired by Cisco in 2007. Bobby Guha Sarkar is the director of products for cloud security at Cisco, having joined the company through the acquisition of OpenDNS. With more than 20 years of experience in the networking and security industry, Mr. Guha Sarkar brings a practical understanding of how technology can solve business problems. Previously, he held a number of positions at Aruba Networks, Juniper Networks, and Cisco Systems. We have plenty of valuable content to share with you in today's webcast, so without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Bobby. Bobby? Great. Thank you, Courtney. So, good morning, everybody, and thank you for spending a little time with us, whether you're listening to this live or uh, in a future recorded uh, version. Uh, my name is Bobby Gosarkar, as Courtney mentioned. And I'm joined today by Brian Roddy. Hey, Brian. Hey, Bobby. So what we're going to do is talk to you about Cisco Umbrella, which is a product that we announced at the recent RSA conference. Uh, there's a number of things that we've been doing with uh, the product. Uh, and really, as you heard, Brian and I joined Cisco through the OpenDNS acquisition. So this is really a product that's evolved from the OpenDNS time. And so, Brian, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the work that we've been doing, and then we can jump right into it and talk about the problems that we're trying to solve and the specific new capabilities. That's great. Yeah, so coming into Cisco a couple years ago it has been incredibly exciting for the OpenDNS team, and we've been able to expand our responsibility to really go after a much broader swath of cloud security. And, you know, coming to Cisco, it's like being a kid in a candy store. There's so many technologies that we can pull into the OpenDNS platform to make a better product. That includes web proxy technology, file scanning and file reputation technology, sandboxing technology. And the fact that we're expanding our platform beyond just DNS to include this broader set of cloud security is why we have kind of rebranded the product as Cisco Umbrella. Great. Thank you, Brian. So. Let's get right into it. Let's talk specifically about the problems that we're looking to solve with Cisco Umbrella and then get into some of the features and how they work. And I would encourage you, if you have any questions, any comments, please type them into the Q&A box and I will stop periodically to have a look at the questions and answer them as we go by. So, first of all, if you look at the big trend that's happening out there, I mean, if you look at Gartner, they're saying that over 25% of most corporations' data traffic was going to bypass perimeter security. And depending on the vertical that you work in, that could be a lot more. So if you work at a law firm or if you work at a real estate agency, that could be upwards of 75%. I know that uh, here at Cisco, uh, many of the people here are knowledge workers, and so for us, it's well above 25%. Now, if you, if you think about what that means, the way that most people have built their network, most, the way that most people have built their IT architecture, it's really been around uh, a fixed location, right? So employees go into a specific office location, they log into the network, branch offices backhaul all their traffic back to headquarters. So from a security standpoint, the focus on security has been to obviously protect the perimeter, protect the endpoint, and then have this sort of stack of security technology that is at the headquarters. And so by backhauling all the traffic to, from the branches to the headquarters and by VPNing in, you can take advantage of all of that security in the HQ. But of course, as we are all living through, we know that things are changing. Um, I think that depending on depending on the size of your company, depending on the vertical of your company, you might be further along on the migration to cloud than others. But certainly I think that when you look at what's changed, I think the bottom line is that more and more is happening off the corporate network. So when you look at the critical infrastructure, you look at servers, applications, the data, 
Uh, much of that is now at least partially resident in a public cloud data center, or it might actually be com a completely outsourced SaaS application like Office 365 or Google Suite or things like DocuSign or Basecamp. I mean, every single aspect of your company is probably using a different type of a SaaS application today, and as we know, those are outside the corporate perimeter. Um, so when you look at the effect of that, you know, users, they no longer need to connect to the VPN in order to get to those applications. And oftentimes they don't. They don't turn on the VPN. Um, and then from a branch office perspective, what we're seeing is that, you know, the, the classical architecture has been a MPLS WAN that goes back to a hub and spoke type of architecture, and that's relatively expensive. And if many of the applications are outside of the perimeter, then why continue to pay for that expensive telecom link? A lot of folks are looking at direct Internet access at the branch office as well. So a lot of things are changing really just off of the fact that the applications are no longer within the enterprise. And this, is, this, isn't, this isn't anything new. I'm sure you know, you're dealing with this in your job on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Brian, go ahead, please. Yeah, so, you know, and on top of that, you have the rise of the roaming user and mobile device everywhere, right? So if you look at, you, if you look at the rise of these business applications, you have, peop, you know, sales workers working in a Starbucks, out making a sales call, connecting to Salesforce.com, and you've come, this, this is the reason we've completely bypassed the uh, perimeter security. It's because it's a very efficient, effective model for workers to enable them and empower them to go straight to the Internet. Yeah, and then to that point, Brian, if we look at some of the statistics, and, you know, that the industry analysts are measuring, I mean, just like you said, you know, many in many companies, half of the workforce is mobile. Um, you know, many of those people are actually admitting to not using the VPN all the time. Uh, and, I mean, I think that, you know, when you look at things like ransomware that have been spreading so, um, you know, so much like wildfire, really, some of that is definitely due to the fact that the the security stack that's sitting in corporate isn't being taken advantage of by the end users because they're outside of the perimeter. Yeah, I mean, it, what we've seen pretty consistently is when people engage in their most risky behavior from, say, their laptops, they are not on the VPN. If I'm going to download the latest episode of Westworld off of BitTorrent, I'm not going to do that on the corporate VPN, and that is when I'm most likely to get infected by malware. I don't even know what Westworld is. Is that from like years ago? Oh no, it's a new thing, Bobby. What's, <laughs> okay. old, what's old is new. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you if you look at the the uh, the reality of what needs to happen as people use more and more, uh, you know, uh, of these applications outside of of the perimeter, is that the security that we're applying, whether it's security that's network security, whether it's endpoint security, all of our controls some of that really must shift to the cloud uh, because the cloud is a natural place to apply these controls because the applications are in the cloud, the end users are on the cloud. And so that's really the, the problem that we're focused on here in the cloud security team at Cisco. And so to that end, really, um, the, the product that we've been working on is a product that we call the Secure Internet Gateway. And I'm going to ask Brian to talk to you a little bit about what our vision is and what our idea is for security as we take on this paradigm of users and apps in the cloud. Yeah, what we've been thinking about is what do the, all of these issues, the way the work has changed, how does that impact the end user's security need and the corporation's security need around how they access the Internet? You know, when people go to the Internet, I make the joke about people using BitTorrent, but people do do those kinds of behaviors with their laptop. And so it's not, for instance, just HTTP anymore. You're using custom apps that are connecting directly to cloud services over different ports and protocols. So you need to cover all ports and protocols. That's incredibly important. Also, the range of threats out there, the threat landscape is so complicated and evolving so quickly that the amount of intelligence required today to effectively block 
is enormous. And it's very, very hard to just have that be a standalone snapshot point in time kind of intelligence. You need that to be as close to real time and live as possible. So these are just examples of when we look at this, we say to ourselves, we really need to reinvent that security model, that gateway model for how we connect to things. And it needs not only to include the client, it also needs to think about the server. It needs to think about the fact that you're connecting to these cloud-based applications. So you need the traditional techniques of being able to do blocking based on uh, where people are going, doing file inspection, all the traditional techniques, but done in the context of the new ways people are accessing things. And that's what we're calling the Secure Internet Gateway. Great. Thanks, Brian. And so Cisco's Secure Internet Gateway is called Cisco Umbrella. And this is a product um, that is built upon the OpenDNS platform. And so why don't we get right into what the product does and what are some of the new capabilities. And then, folks, if you have questions, um, please do type them in. And then as we go through the section, we'll go ahead and take some of the questions that are here. Okay, so what is Cisco Umbrella? So Cisco Umbrella is a cloud security platform. Think of Cisco Umbrella as really providing a first line of defense against threats on the Internet. And the way that Umbrella works is we analyze and learn from Internet activity. So we are constantly looking at where users are going on the Internet. And by doing that, we are then able to uncover the attacker infrastructure and what's being used to stage current and new threats. And so then what we do is we then proactively block requests that go out from a customer's network or from a customer's endpoint to this malicious destination on the internet. So what can you do with this? So basically, with Umbrella, you can stop phishing and malware infections very, very early in the kill chain. Um, you can identify already infected devices that are in your network, and you can hopefully prevent data ex exfiltration as well. So when many customers uh, look at Cisco Umbrella and they trial it, they are immediately surprised to see how many machines within their environment are actually already infected with bots and how, how they're reaching out to various places, including things like, you know, medical IoT devices, including things like, you know, um, cameras and televisions and, you know, non, sort of non-computing devices that are in the enterprise today. Um, because Umbrella is built into the Internet, if you will, and it's delivered from the cloud, you get uh, a much more complete visibility over everything in your environment reaching out to the Internet. So, and one of the, one, and the, the, real, the real way that Umbrella works is through DNS. And DNS, if you, if you think about DNS, it's really the control plane of the Internet. So, it's really a way to understand where, where things are bound to go on the Internet. So let's take a look at how you might think of Umbrella and how you might deploy Umbrella in your typical security stack today. Um, the, the first thing you should really ask yourself is, you know, wh where are your control points today, right? So typically today, people have network control points, people have endpoint control points, uh, and really all of that technology, most of that technology is really about detecting malicious software and then blocking it, preventing it from executing and so on, whether it's a sandbox, whether it's a IPS, whether it's an NGFW, whether it's endpoint security and so on. Where, where Umbrella fits into this is Umbrella can really be the first layer of defense by preventing devices from connecting to these malicious sites in the first place. So what that ends up doing is that the number or the amount of incidents of malware that get onto your network and get onto your endpoints goes down significantly. So we see examples of uh, customers like retailers, for example, when they put an umbrella, they see a dramatic reduction in what they see on their firewall and on their antivirus console because a lot of the stuff is being caught very, very early. Um, so how does Umbrella work? Umbrella uses DNS, so you basically point your DNS to Umbrella, and then uh, it, it, we service the DNS request, and then we look at the destination, and if the destination is malicious, then we enforce a security policy. 
And we have security policies that are based on malware, that are based on drive-by downloads, phishing, and so on. And so it's it's all sort of set up for you automatically. And then um, based on based on how malicious the destination is, it's blocked. Now, if you think about the way that um, that people would generally set this up today, so it's pretty easy. I mean, you basically look at your existing DNS server today, and most DNS servers then would do recursive DNS to their ISP. And we're going to cover DNS in just a second in a little bit of detail, but you'd make the change there. So in your Microsoft DNS server or in your Infoblox DNS server, you'd make the change there. We have also been working over the last year with Cisco and with Cisco's networking equipment so that if you have an ISR 4K or if you have an Aeronet wireless implementation, uh, there's out-of-the-box integration with those, uh, with those uh, 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 products so that you can do, for example, you can, set, you can say, for example, the guest VLAN coming into my branch router gets a specific policy from Umbrella, whereas the employee VLAN gets a different policy from Umbrella. And this is all automatic, and this is all done uh, just by a simple checkbox. Uh, similarly, the same thing you know, is, uh, is going to be happening with the Aeronet uh, products as well. Um, from an endpoint perspective, so when, when the end user is not on the corporate network, um, we leverage uh, two endpoint technologies. One is the original OpenDNS endpoint agent, which is called a roaming client, and that continues to be developed and continues to be improved upon. And then we also have integrated the agent into the Cisco AnyConnect client as well. So this is version 4.3 and higher, so that if you're using the AnyConnect client for VPN, you can also use it for connecting to Umbrella as well. So this is how, this is how the, 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 the connectivity works. But what I always like to do uh, for people that are unfamiliar with DNS, or I should say not unfamiliar, but probably need a refresher course, uh, I can tell you that being a networking guy myself uh, for 20 years and joining OpenDNS a couple of years ago, I thought I knew DNS, and then I really didn't, <laughs> right? And so, um, so it's probably worth to do a quick five-minute refresher on how DNS works so that you can understand how we're leveraging DNS in order to provide security within Umbrella. So... Uh, let's let's do that really quickly, and and Brian, I might ask you to uh, to help us on a couple of these uh, as well. Okay? Sure. So uh, when people think about DNS, there's really kind of three areas of DNS that are that are worth understanding. Number one is there's the concept of the domain registrar, and so the domain registrar is really where a domain name is registered. So think about this. If you think about the analogy of a phone book. Think about this as really writing an entry into the phone book. And as we know in the U.S., companies like GoDaddy provide domain registration services. The same way that you'd record a name and a phone number in a phone book, GoDaddy will record a domain name and an IP address in a phone book. Then there's the concept of an authoritative DNS server or an authoritative name server. This is really, uh, think about this as really the publishing of the phone book. So this is the server where you keep the specific record that you've bought from GoDaddy. So you might use something like Amazon's Route 53 service to keep the name record. Okay? And then the final piece of this is what's called a recursive DNS provider or recursive DNS server. And this is really, in the, in the analogy of the phone book, think about this as the operator. So you'd call the operator and you'd ask, you know, hey, you know, can you look up this person's phone number for me? This is the same exact thing. This is basically the lookup service that you can use to look up the IP address of a domain. Typically, the recursive DNS provider is your ISP. So if you're using Verizon or if you're using Level 3, or if you're using Comcast, this is who will be providing your recursive DNS uh, services today. So when you look at a typical enterprise, um, most enterprises have multiple ISPs that they connect to around the world. So a different office would have different ISP. In addition, 
For your mobile phones, you would have probably a different service provider. In addition, for your, your remote users or your home users, you might have a different broadband service provider. So all of these different service providers are providing that DNS resolution today. Now notice that this vector is not being leveraged for security today, even though the data that is going to these ISPs is actually quite rich. So all of these ISPs know every single destination that your end users are going to, and some of those are malicious, and that's where they're downloading the ransomware or the exploit kit or any other uh, malware. So wouldn't it be great if you could actually leverage this vector in order to get visibility where people are going and then hopefully to block those malicious destinations? And that's exactly what Cisco Umbrella does. Cisco Umbrella leverages a global recursive DNS service or, or, or network in which you point to Cisco Umbrella. Cisco Umbrella then resolves that DNS request, whether you're inside the corporate network in an office, whether you're using a, um, a branch office, whether you're at a partner's location, whether you're you know, in the airport, uh, at a construction facility, really it doesn't matter where. Any ISP that you're using Cisco Umbrella really is an over-the-top DNS service provider, regardless of which service provider you're using. So hopefully that gives you a, a little bit of clarity on how this works and why this is an interesting, uh, interesting sort of technology to use in order to, uh, in order, in, in order to look at security. Now, Brian, maybe I'll turn to you now. And so now that kind of folks have an understanding of what recursive DNS is and so on. Tell us a little bit about how we're using this specifically to apply security. It's a great question. So it, I like to think about it in two broad ways. The first is uh, oftentimes a user will want to go to a site that is hosting malware, and we want to be able to stop that. And the good news is that for them to go to that site that's hosting malware, say because they've gotten fished in some way or another, they will have to go to a particular domain. We'll have categorized that as a malicious domain and will prevent them from even, even being able to download the malware to begin with. So that's incredibly powerful. On top of that, the more than 90% of the mal of malware uses in its command and control infrastructure uh, DNS in order to reach out to get instructions on what to do. So let's say you've downloaded a botnet that's sending traffic out to other folks on your behalf being able to block them from reaching that command and control system essentially disables the bot. So what's really great about DNS is it provides this very, very simple to deploy, easy to roll out connection point on the internet, this control point on the internet, and use that to stop malicious actors very quickly. And we're able to use that and expand that, and I'll talk about this in a bit, to create a wide range of intelligence kind of across the board. Now, I will say that, you know, we're talking a lot about DNS, and I saw that one of the questions that came through is people are a little confused. What, what's the difference between open DNS and umbrella? And this is something that, you know, we get a lot. You know, to give a little bit of a history, before the company was acquired, before open DNS was acquired, we had a bit of a branding problem. You know, we were called open DNS, and yet we became a security company. And open and DNS are not typically associated with, with security. And so we always had our product be OpenDNS Umbrella. We had a security product which was OpenDNS Umbrella, but we realized as we expanded within Cisco, we did want to keep that open nature, but it was more than just DNS. So since we were taking this core OpenDNS Umbrella product and expanding it, and because we were now part of Cisco, rebranding it as Cisco Umbrella seemed like a natural step for us to both advance it as a security product, but also represent the broader set of capabilities out there. So. The, the dumb version of the answer is there is no difference. It's the same product it was before it's OpenDNS uh, umbrella and Cisco umbrella, the same thing. The more subtle answer is it is the same product, but massively expanded by all these great new technologies and capabilities. Which we're going to talk about in just a couple of minutes. And then, and then, Brian, maybe I might add one other thing, because I know yeah. a lot of folks ask this question, and sometimes what they mean is, hey, look, I've been using OpenDNS for years at home. Yeah. Is that the same thing as what you're talking about here? And, and really, it, it's, uh, it's not. So if you look at our home product, which continues to be free, 
and it's still under the open DNS brand, it's really about um, giving you content filtering. You know, if you have kids, for example, and you don't want them to go to certain websites, the open DNS home product can help you to restrict where people are going to on the internet. What the enterprise product does, which is what Cisco Umbrella is, is uh, doing that, but it's also blocking malware. So we don't block any malware on the home product. On the enterprise product, on the Cisco Umbrella product, we block malware. That's probably the easiest way to think about it. And so the home product continues to be free. We will always keep it free. Um, if you, if in, in fact, a, a little known secret, I guess it's not a secret because we, we actually sell uh, sell this, but I mean, you can buy uh, a, a version of the enterprise product for your home for just 20 bucks a year. So we actually sell like, you know, you can have have up to five machines at home that can get the, the, the malware blocking at home for $20 a year. You can go to OpenDNS's website to, to, to see that. But really the big difference is that the, uh, Cisco Umbrella product blocks malware, and then like Brian was saying, we have been adding a web proxy, we've been adding, uh, you know, file inspection and sandboxing and stuff to this product as well, and so that's what we're going to talk about uh, just now. So thank you for that question. And Brian, if you're, if you don't mind as I'm uh, going through the next section, maybe have a quick look at the questions and if there's anything else that is worth. Uh, yeah, you know, another question. I, another yeah. question I saw is, you know, since we talked about DNS, but we also talked about other capabilities, people have asked questions like, uh, do you need an endpoint? Do you need a connector in order to make this work? Well, the short answer to that is no. You can just point your DNS at us and we will provide that protection. The only reason that you need the endpoint is for two scenarios where Say the, uh, the user is roaming, they're at Starbucks and they're getting their DNS settings from the DHCP of Starbucks. Well, we need some way to force that traffic to us. So our roaming client, all it does is it just redirects your DNS traffic to OpenDNS to make sure that happens. The other reason that we, we have an endpoint and in in, in something integrated into our networking stack is around identity. We have what you might call a NAT problem, that if someone's behind a network address translation, we might not know if it's Bobby's laptop or Brian's laptop that made that DNS request, the agent allows us to differentiate that. So the short answer is no, you don't need it. The more subtle answer is, hey, if you have these endpoints, you get better reporting capabilities in order to determine where things are at and to cover roaming users. Okay, great. And then before we jump in, there was a question that uh, about does this integrate with Cisco Meraki equipment? And the short answer on that is not yet. We are actively working with the Meraki team. Of course, as you know, you can make any equipment work with Cisco Umbrella. It's just a matter of manually configuring it. So when we talk about integrating with equipment, we're talking about kind of an automation step so that it's just literally a checkbox in the configuration. Um, and, you know, some of you might know that, you know, we've previously integrated with, uh, you know, Aruba wireless equipment, Arrowhive wireless equipment, cradle point routers. So um, we're, we are actively working with the Cisco Meraki team and expect to see that soon as well. But like I said, you can make it work today just fine with the, with the Meraki. I was talking to those, those guys this morning about it, actually. Fantastic. Cool. Okay, so let's, let's go back into it. There's some questions around how do we know what to block and how is this better or different than, like, IP URL uh, reputation. So we'll go into that in, in just a second here. So... So maybe um, going into a little bit more detail about what Umbrella does. So as I mentioned, you point DNS to Umbrella, and then uh, basically what Umbrella is doing is looking at the destination domain. And if that domain is malicious, then we'll block that domain. Uh, if the domain is benign, we will allow that domain, meaning that we will resolve that DNS request for the, for the IP address of that domain, and we'll send that back to the client. Now... Uh, what happens when the, if the domain is uh, potentially risky? So say it's something like Reddit, where there is good content and there is potentially bad content or malicious content. What happens then? Well, then what we do then is we then take that particular connection and then we point that to our proxy, our web proxy in the cloud. And this is some of the new capabilities that we've been we've been integrating. And so the idea there is that if we need to look deeper for a particular destination and we're not 100% sure that it's malicious, we will then 
put that through a deeper inspection engine. So Brian, my turn to you now and maybe walk us through a little bit of, this is some of the key development that we've been doing over the last few months here at Cisco uh, into the platform. So talk us through sort of what are the things that we are integrating, how does it work, and, yeah. and how, why is it useful? No, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting set of technology. So now that we have a very strong model of what's good and what's bad and what's, you might say, iffy or sketchy, we're now able to run that traffic that we have concerns about that we're not sure if it's completely bad. So on a site like Reddit, you may have a wonderful set of cat pictures, but someone may also have a, you know, a set of a malware that's linked off of that site into, into someplace bad or, or a file that's uploaded that's, uh, that, that, that has malware in it. So what we do is we're able to send that traffic through our proxy. And we do all the things that a proxy would traditionally do about checking for malicious traffic. It, we check the URL. We say, hey, is this a known bad URL? So we might know a site is good, but a particular URL there is bad, say with something like Dropbox. We know most of the files there are good. Some might be bad. And then uh, if we can't determine purely based on the URL, then we can run the content that is running through the proxy through traditional AV style engines as well as the Cisco technology, things like AMP, where we can look at the file reputation and determine if this is a good or bad file. And we're also been adding threat grid support, a sandbox support. So you can send that file that you've downloaded to a sandbox where it can be examined and exploded to determine if it's good or bad, and get a, you can get a retrospective report on whether or not that file was good or bad. So what's really nice about this is you get all the benefits of that proxy capability, but only in areas that you really want to be inspected. So you're not slowing down traffic that you don't care about, but you're getting the deep inspection you need to make sure that files aren't malicious. And Brian, just just to be clear on the on the inclusion of AMP and on the threat grid, uh, so that's within the umbrella product you're talking about, that's correct. right? That's correct. So there's nothing else to purchase. That's it's right. Included as a part of umbrella. Yeah. So the so the AMP capabilities are part of some of the packages that we have for umbrella and for threat grid. Uh, that that will require a threat grid subscription, but that's included with a, a large number of Cisco products. Great. And configuration of all this is within the umbrella product. That's correct. Well. Super easy. Great. Okay. So now let's let's talk a little bit about how we know if a destination is malicious or not, because this is really where a lot of the work that goes in from this team, a lot of the data science that we that we are really spending a lot of effort on, is trying to figure out from this massive amount of data if something is bad or not. So Brian. Walk us through sort of the basic concept of understanding internet infrastructure, and then that's what we put into our machine intelligence models. Yeah, so what's great is that because we have access to a large amount of data, we're able to look for signatures of behavior and, and uses of the inf internet infrastructure that imply someone's developing malware, deploying malware. So for instance, if I'm a malware developer, I might download uh, a sample set of uh, scripts. I might modify them. I'd install them on a set of servers that are my test servers. I might give that a domain. And I might, uh, in order for me to, to play around with it, I need to get a server in an ISP that won't get suspicious. So I'll often go to a more sketchy part of the internet, a sketchy ISP that will provide that for me. And I'll run a whole bunch of test runs. And then when I'm ready, I'll migrate that infrastructure to a more robust infrastructure that I can then roll out. Well, this kind of pattern we see over and over and over again. We know where the sketchy parts of the internet are. We know what the signatures of these behaviors are. And because we have enough data, we're, we are able to detect them. So if you go to the next slide, you know, the reason that we have access to all of that data is because we have so many home users using our product. We have 85 million daily active users in 160 countries. That's more countries than there are uh, folks in the Olympics, uh, countries in the Olympics. So that means that we get pretty broad coverage of both uh, highly reputable uh, governments as well as countries which uh, have more malicious actors in them. That data allows us to see this behavior well in advance and run it through our models, our, our predictors for what's good and what's bad. So if you go to the next slide, we have a large team uh, within, our, within the Cisco umbrella side of the house 
that has been building these models to predict where this bad behavior is. And we've coupled that team with the broader Cisco Talos team, which is the largest security threat research team in the world, in order to continue to improve our intelligence. Now, our models are everything from really simple stuff, like we know where the bad parts of the internet are. If we see a set of domains running in a particular network on the internet uh, that are hosting malicious uh, content or malware, we're gonna be suspicious of other things in those areas. If someone registers a domain with a who is entry of a particular email address for something bad and that person registers another one, we're gonna be suspicious of that domain. So those are the easy cases. But we've ranged it all the way up to more complex, uh, more machine learning style techniques, where for instance, if someone registers ciscosupports.com, we'll see that the part of that domain is representative of a very large uh, domain on the internet. We'll then be suspicious of phishing. So we'll scrape that site and we'll look at the content on that site and we'll use a similarity metric, much how search engines use similarity metrics, to compare that to the content on actual cisco.com. If we see they're similar, we then are now suspicious that this is a phishing site because they're replicating the content on one site in another. So what's very exciting for us is that we can automate a lot of the beha behavioral detection here because hackers have to do the same kinds of things because of the nature of the infrastructure, because of the nature of phishing itself to automatically detect them. And, and, uh, and Brian, I mean, I, I was gonna say, I know that we get quite geeked out about this math, and you know we we love this stuff, and I know some folks do as well. So if uh, if folks out there listening, you know, if I mean the reason we go into this kind of detail is that we're we're quite we're quite uh, confident about sort of what we're doing with our data and what that kind of brings us, and uh, what we always encourage people to do is give us a try. Uh, you know, you can easily try the product, and you can see for yourself the efficacy. Um, and if you want to geek out more about some of these things, you know, on our YouTube channel, uh, we publish uh, many of these individual classifier models in great detail. We talk about what, what it's doing, what algorithm it is, what we're doing to the data. So, you know, you can, you can have a look uh, uh, on your own as well. So, I was going to say, so in terms of what is the net result? Well, at the end of the day, what is all this wonderful... PhD level <laughs> statistical math get us. Yeah, and, and look, I think this is the reason that we encourage people to try Umbrella. It's so unbelievably easy to try. You can take some subset of your network, some guest network, some branch office, point your DNS at us, run the product in non-blocking mode, so it just performs like it always did. And you can see for yourself these numbers, this efficacy, the fact that we do discover so much malware out there that you'll see all the things that we can block. And the proof in any security product is in its effectiveness and its ability to block things. So what we do is to just give folks an idea of scale, every day three million new domains are added to the internet. It's crazy, it's a huge amount. And so we're in real time processing that. And we often get the heads up of seeing those domains even before they've been distributed globally because we're in so many different countries, we'll immediately jump in and start analyzing those domains to look for the bad things. We identify, you can see here, 60,000 domains often before any malware has been served. So we can proactively block even before any malware has been downloaded and know we don't have to wait for someone to be infected to know something's up. And that allows us to enforce and aggregate more than seven million domains at any given time. Just think about the scope and size of seven million domains. This is incredibly hard for devices like network devices to have coverage of that broad a set of domains because the data set is so large. It's hard to cram that onto a physical device. Being in the cloud, we're able to get as close to real time as possible with this massive amount of coverage. So as, a, as this extra layer of security, as this first line of defense, it is, it is incredibly powerful and we catch things no one else can catch. Great, thanks Brian. So a um, couple other quick things uh, here before we sort of uh, wrap up. Um, so hopefully uh, some of that was useful and interesting to you in terms of how we actually look at all of uh, the data on the internet and how having a large presence actually provides the confidence to particularly 
convict a domain or convict a URL or an IP address. So um, as I mentioned, in terms of deployment, uh, the, the deployment of this technology is very simple. You point your DNS to Cisco Umbrella and off you go. Uh, you can actually, like Brian was saying, try this yourself. Uh, you can go to the uh, umbrella.cisco.com website, sign up there for a free trial. Do it all yourself. You don't need to have anybody at Cisco help you. You don't need to call anybody. No one has to contact you or anything else. Um, in terms of how to deploy this on the corporate network, you could do this on a router. You could do it, you could do it on a DNS server. And then, of course, like I mentioned, we have the uh, end uh, endpoint agent that you can use uh, for, uh, for roaming devices. Um, now, in terms of, you know, just so you just, you know, there's a question here that came about routing. And so I just want to be clear, this is, uh, we're not talking about IP routing and routing everything from a network over to Umbrella. We're talking about just DNS. So it's a lot simpler. So every network is going to have a recursive DNS um, setting in it. You can do it either in the router or you can do it on the DNS, like I'm, like I'm mentioning. So you don't need to tunnel. You don't need to put all traffic to Umbrella. And one of the benefits, some people have been asking questions, well, then how do you proxy in that context? What we are able to do is transparently proxy using DNS. So let's say I want to go to a suspiciouss.site.com. Instead of returning the IP address for suspiciouss.site.com, I can return the IP address of our cloud proxy, and that way tunnel transparently that traffic through our proxy. So you don't need agents to, de to be deployed. Some people have asked about that in order to get the benefits of our proxy. We can do that manually. The other question that people have asked, uh, and I think these are, this is a really important question, is, uh, is the endpoint the only way to get identity? And I think this is something that we should, we should just take a moment to say. Yes, an endpoint is a great way to get identity. Our integration with our network uh, products, like the ISR, like Cisco uh, Wireless, is a way for us to get identity. In addition, if you are behind a NAT, we also have something called a virtual appliance, which can connect to your Active Directory and maintain a mapping of who your users are and what IP addresses they are using internally. And we can forward that information on for those requests to make sure that we maintain the identity of who the people are behind the, behind the NAT. So we have many techniques available for you depending on your environment and your requirements in order to get that visibility. And again, the benefit is we have this very flexible deployment model to get coverage very quickly across the board, and you can incremental, incrementally add these agents or appliances to get more information and reporting. And the only thing I would add, Brian, is that that virtual appliance uh, is managed by Cisco Umbrella, the, the service. So as an administrator, you don't have to actually do anything. You don't have to upgrade it. You don't have to, you don't literally have to touch it just like the endpoint agent is also automatically managed by Cisco Umbrella as well. So all of the benefits of cloud-based software is available on everything that we've talked about so far. Um, I, think, uh, I think maybe, uh, you know, the last couple of points that I, I want to talk about is just, um, so, you know, given that this is a, a SaaS product and given that this is, a, this is a sort of a modern generation of, of product, one of the things that we've done is we have built the entire product using APIs. So similar to how AWS has built their services and products internally around APIs, uh, we've done the same thing here. And so one of the things that that uh, affords us is the opportunity to expose those APIs to you as a as a administrator, to you as a uh, as an as a user of the product but also to other security vendors. So if, if a security vendor wants to leverage the API in order to send us an indicator of compromise, uh, programmatically, that is something that is, uh, is doable as well. So we've been doing this now with um, you know, many of the Cisco products, but candidly also with other vendors as well, even with Cisco competitive products, because we believe that you know really, what we want to do at the end of the day is improve everybody's security effectiveness, improve everybody's security posture, and we know that there's lots of folks out there that have deployed many different vendors, many different technologies. Wouldn't it be great to just have them first work better together? And then you can maybe move on to say, hey, what's the best product in each category? So 
whether it's uh, you know it's uh, things like FireEye or things like uh, Anomaly or things like Splunk uh, or any of the um, or even Checkpoint, uh, you can actually programmatically connect them with Umbrella, and you can send a, an indicator to Umbrella. And basically, the way this works is that if there is a particular malicious file, let's say, that is detected by uh, something like a FireEye sandbox, uh, and it can detect the destination domains that that piece of malware is, is reaching out to, it can automatically send that to Umbrella, and then Umbrella can block those malicious domains automatically. And this would be in addition to the intelligence that Umbrella has. So we're then leveraging if you've made any investments in something like FireEye or something like Splunk to then uh, couple that intelligence with what we have in Umbrella. So it really gives you, gives you a multiplier effect in terms of your immediate ability to add the intelligence from different vendors together. So, so we have this sort of uh, API that you can push information to Umbrella. You can also pull information. So you can also ask us, hey, what do you know about this IP address? Hey, what do you know about this domain? What do you, you know, what do you know about this malware hash? And we will tell you everything that we know about that particular domain, that IP address. You know, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of variables that we can supply. And a lot of folks that are using things like Splunk or Anomaly and, and other uh, SIM devices are, are, are using this uh, this ingestion API in order to get more information. So. Um, something else that's available in the product here. Um, okay, so moving on, um, Brian, uh, we talked about some of the new capabilities that we have added to the Umbrella platform, specifically with the web proxying. I'm glad you clarified that question. I mean, I mean people people ask that question around, hey, how do we get to the proxy if you're not taking a tunnel? Yeah. Um, and uh, also about, uh, about the AV engines and about uh, AMP being included. Um, so those are exciting capabilities. Over the next month or so, we're going to make that generally available to anybody who's an Umbrella user, as well as in the free trial as well. So look forward to that. Uh, but tell us a little bit about sort of what we're thinking. What's our vision for this product? What could it be in a year? What could it be in two years? Yeah, so what, what we are trying to do is essentially recreate as much of the existing on-premise security stack in the cloud. Because at Cisco, what we believe is we want to allow our customers to have the choice of deployment options for everything that they do. We want to make sure that they have an on-prem on set of deployment options and cloud-based and have common policy across the board. So our vision here is to not just stop with the set of file scanning and proxy technologies that we have today, but to go even deeper, to add additional capabilities like application visibility and control. We're actively working on building that out right now uh, for our product and how we tie that we haven't talked much today about our CASB solution, CloudLock, but how those things all get tied together. On top of that, you know, we view this as, an, as a way for us to add more and more capabilities. So people have been asking us for port and protocol blocking, so we're actively working on a project around that. So we have a wide range of things that we plan to add to the platform over time and really keep that in tight concert with, with the on-prem side of things. A couple of people have asked, what is the connection to, to on-premise uh, hardware and things like, hey, I have a WSA today. How does that impact, how does Umbrella impact? Well, the good news is Umbrella can be deployed very easily as an added layer of security on top of all of your existing infrastructure, either on top of it for all users or just roaming users. What's the benefit of this model is we can really continue to add additional security to, to your users wherever they are. And as you mentioned, the other, other really exciting thing is because we can ingest threat feeds from places like FireEye, we're really trying to be open. We're trying, we recognize Cisco is not going to be your only security vendor. You might have multiple security vendors. We want to make it very easy for you to pull together all of that information you're getting from your other vendors and have an easy way of enforcing that across all your user base, including roaming users. So Umbrella is really that great first line of defense, and we're going to continue to expand its capabilities over time to make it richer and richer and richer. And as a SaaS application, the benefit is those features just keep rolling out uh, to the product. Great. Thanks, Brian. So I think we'll, uh, we'll sort of end uh, wrap up here. And so in, in wrapping, I, I think what I'd say is, you know, uh, you should. You, you know, what we always 
encourage our, our customers to do is to try it for themselves. You know, we can, we as a vendor can do our best job in trying to earn your business. We can tell you everything that we've been working on, and we're quite passionate about all of the work that's being done here, whether it's on the data science, whether it's on the security front, whether it's on the threat research, and or whether it's on the internet engineering side to make sure that Umbrella is continues to be a 100% uptime product. There's a lot of work being done here, a lot of passionate folks, but ultimately, you know, does it work for you? Ultimately, is it something that's effective for you? And we we have uh, worked very hard to make the trialing of Umbrella as frictionless as possible for you with zero, zero touch from anybody at Cisco. You can do it yourself. There's uh, very good documentation. Not that you'll need it because it's actually very, very simple. So uh, we'd encourage you to give it a try, um, see, you know, see for yourself, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, we have a chance to earn your business. Okay, with that, uh, Brian, do we want to have a quick look at some of the questions and uh, see if we can answer any outstanding questions that people have? We've had a bunch of questions, so thank you very much. If we don't get to your question, I will make sure and email every single person back an answer to your question. This way you'll, you'll have the answer today. Some folks have asked, how do you handle uh, requests that go straight to an IP address and, and bypass DNS? This is a case where we do rely on our agent, so either the AnyConnect agent or the ERC agent, because we need some way of being able to intercept that traffic before it goes out and tunnel into our infrastructure. So we do support that today. If you've deployed an agent, you get the advantage of incremental protection uh, based on IP address. The question that came in, does Umbrella include content filtering for inappropriate content? And the answer to that is yes, it does. And uh, the, you know, uh, you can. Uh, that's one of the main capabilities of Umbrella. It's been doing that for years. So the answer is yes. Uh, a couple of people have asked about uh, distributed denial of service attacks on our infrastructure, uh, probably because of the Dyne incident that happened about six months ago. So the first thing to bear in mind is Dyne provides what what we talked about earlier, which was authoritative DNS. That's where companies register which domains map to which IP addresses. As a recursive DNS provider, we aggregate and cache that information. And in fact, we have a rule in our cache, which is a smart cache, which says, hey, look, even if this domain is supposed to expire, if we can't reach uh, the authoritative infrastructure like Dyne, keep it around anyway. So open DNS users were not impacted, their in internet was not impacted when Dyne went down because we just cached all the data in there. And though you know, maybe one or two things became stale after a certain period of time, the internet was largely unaffected. Now as to ourselves, we do get, uh, we get denial of service attacks uh, against us all the time. In fact, at any given time, there is a sizable denial of service attack happening on our infrastructure because it's the internet and everyone is a jerk out there trying to trying to stop things. The good news is we've built very sophisticated techniques to, to stop those attacks. We have 25 data centers around the world and have the ability to redirect and reroute traffic. And as such, we've been able to maintain 100% uptime across the board for the past 10 years. Um, and so we're really, really proud of our ability of our infrastructure to be resilient and to stand up to denial of service attacks uh, across the board. Of course, we, you know, the, it is something that keeps me up at night because uh, there are very, very large hammers out there for any kind of infrastructure, um, but it's an ongoing battle we'll continue to fight as best we can. Okay, a couple other quick questions. Uh, can Umbrella whitelist domains or URLs? Answer is yes. yes. Um, the next question is, um, is there umbrella pricing for government or for uh, higher ed? And the answer is yes. If you just talk to your Cisco salesperson, uh, they'll be able to get you that pricing. Um, a couple of the questions. Um, can you talk about SSL inspection? So, Brian, maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, so we, we do support... Uh a man-in-the-middle style inspection. Uh, it does require that you, uh, like all man-in-the-middle solutions, require uh, install a cert, a trusted cert from us into people's, say, web browsers in order for us to uh, break open that traffic. 
Perfect. So it's uh, it's it's uh, it's supported. Yep. Um, you know, some so there's some folks here who are actually existing customers, and they're asking, when will the new interface arrive? So uh, the good news is we are rolling that out over the course of the next couple months. If you'd like to get an accelerated preview and get on the list to get in there early, uh, please just reach out to your support contact and let us know, and we'll, we'll be happy to move you forward in the line. Great. And then um, just having a quick look at the questions here. Uh, okay, so there's some questions around... Uh, uh, how do you handle uh, local DNS queries for things like printers and other local things? Yeah, because we're a recursive DNS service, you'll only reach out to us for those things which are not handled internally. And so the nature of DNS itself just solves that problem very naturally. So that's the good news. We work very, very well with on-premise on authoritative DNS systems um, and, uh, and, and shouldn't cause you any issues. Now, if those printers themselves start reaching out to, say, the Internet, they'll hit the recursive DNS infrastructure, and then we'll block them. And that is actually something that happens more often than not. Yes. Um, okay, great. I think that uh, we have answered most of the questions. And again, folks, I will uh, get the list of questions as soon as we finish this webcast, and I'll make sure that every one of the questions are answered by email. And... Um, Thank you very much for the time. Uh, we're very excited about Umbrella, and hopefully you'll get a chance to, to, to trial it, and uh, hopefully it'll be exciting for you as well. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much.